There is a discrete calculus that is not as well known as its continuous counterpart. Nevertheless, it is quite useful, especially when doing discrete time dynamical systems. The big idea is this. Continuous calculus, the calculus that you are most familiar with, is for functions of a continuous input. Functions like, let's say, x of t, where t is time, some real variable. On the other hand, discrete calculus is built for functions with a discrete input or a discrete time. These will often be denoted x of n, where n is a natural number. Now, when you learned calculus, you did see digital input or discrete input functions. You probably call these sequences. That's what this calculus is going to be built for. So let's talk about discrete time functions. Our notation is going to be as follows. A discrete time function is going to be indexed by n most of the time and denoted x. Oftentimes, we'll use parentheses to denote the fact that this is something like a sequence with xn inside. Or maybe we might just expand the whole thing out. x0, x1, x2, etc., etc. So, for example, consider the function n squared. This would be the discrete time analog of t squared. The values of this function would be 0 squared, 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, etc. This would look like a quadratic function. And one could write down lots of other polynomial functions as well. What about other types of discrete input functions? Well, consider the function 2 to the n. That is 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, etc., etc. This would be an example of an exponential function of n. And there would be lots of others as well. This one just has base 2. Consider the following discrete function. I'm going to denote this fn. This is going to be 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34. Hmm. Do we recognize this? Does this look familiar? I think I've seen this before. These are the Fibonacci numbers, and this is the Fibonacci sequence. We're going to come back to that one later on in this volume. For now, the question is, given such discrete input functions, how do we produce a calculus? How do we do things like derivatives, integrals, all that good stuff? Well, let's start at the beginning, and let's consider the discrete version of derivatives. Definition, the discrete derivative of a sequence x is going to be denoted delta x. And it's going to be nothing more than the forward difference operator applied to x. That is the sequence whose individual terms are xn plus 1 minus xn. Let's take a look at an example. Consider the quadratic function n squared. So the entries are 0, 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, etc. Now, if I look at the derivative of that, the individual terms are quantity n plus 1 squared minus n squared. Algebraically, I can multiply that out. I get n squared plus 2n plus 1 minus n squared. Simplify that. That gives me the sequence 2n plus 1. If I write out the individual terms, I get 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, etc. Now, if I look back at the original sequence, this difference is giving me the differences in the individual entries. Do you see that? Aha! This, of course, reminds us of what we talked about earlier with operators. And as we've previously shown, for continuous input functions, we have the lemma that delta, the discrete derivative, or the forward difference, is really e minus i, where e is the shift operator now being applied to these discrete input functions. This is the operator that shifts everything over to the left by one unit, dropping the first term. Likewise, i is the identity operator that takes a sequence and does nothing. Okay, so this is a nice relationship between some of these operators that we've seen, both in continuous and discrete calculus. But let's keep going. We've done derivatives. Question, what's an integral? 
Well, like we did in standard calculus class, there are two types of integrals, the indefinite and the definite. The indefinite integral would be given by anti-differentiating, or in this case, anti-differencing. Let's consider the inverse of the forward difference operator, delta. What would delta inverse applied to x do? Well, by our lemma, delta is e minus i. So I need to take the inverse of that operator. Hmm, I wonder. You know, if I factor out a minus sign, and then I'm looking at the inverse of i minus e, then I bet I could apply something like a geometric series to this operator and get that the inverse of i minus e is really i plus e plus e squared plus e cubed, etc., etc., going all the way down the line. Does that work? Well, yes, it does kind of work. It's a little suspicious. I'm especially worried about convergence and, oh wait, where's the plus c? I don't see a plus c in there anywhere. Okay, let's not pursue the indefinite integral. It's a little sketch, but the definite integral, that is not weird at all. That is simply the sum as n goes from a to b of xn. That's the discrete analog of the integral of a function x of t dt as t goes from a to b. Now, of course, once we've got the definite integral, then what we want is something like the fundamental theorem of integral calculus. Is there a fundamental theorem of discrete integral calculus? Well, yes, there is. And it says pretty much the same thing, that if you integrate the derivative of something from a to b, then you get that original something evaluated from a to b. In this case, the discrete version of the fundamental theorem is that the sum, as n goes from a to b, of delta of x n is really going to be x b plus 1 minus x a. So I take the, the derivative of the original sequence, and then I integrate that from a to b, and I get the original sequence evaluated at the endpoints. Now you might know this as a telescoping sum. So the proof of this is really trivial. I mean, there's nothing there at all. Okay, so we've got derivatives, we've got integrals, but wait, there's more. What about discrete calculus versions of other things? Things like exponential functions, things like differential equations, or what about Taylor series and Taylor expansion? That would be cool, can we do that? Yes, we can, but not quite yet. Discrete time functions are really just sequences, but these two possess a calculus. You've got derivatives, you've got integrals, you've got all kinds of other good stuff as well. Now, in some sense, it's easier to define things in discrete calculus. We don't have to worry about limits, we don't have to worry about Riemann sums, anything like that, but it seems a bit harder to do computations. More on that next.